Hi, my name is Brad Aiken, publisher of Stansbury Research. When you joined our firm, we made you a simple promise to provide you with the exact information we'd want if our roles were reversed. And in response to the geopolitical and financial events that have transpired over the past few days, I've asked a few of our top analysts to gather and share their unscripted, unedited opinions about the stock market right now. Please note, this is not a sales message. There's nothing to buy. Now, I know we've been glued to the news for the past few days, wondering and worrying about what might come next. It can be scary, confusing, and sometimes misleading. But at Stansbury Research, we're not just talking heads on a television set. You know our track record, you know our resumes, and you know we have no vested interests in the investments we're discussing. Our entire company and editorial team exists to serve you. That's it. Over our past 22 years in our business, we've guided our readers through the dot-com bubble, the Great Recession, and every single dip and rally since 1999. But this is only the second time in our firm's history that we've hosted an all-hands-on-deck town hall event like this. Our last aired on March of 2020, right as the world first learned of COVID-19 and what it might mean for our health and wealth. You might remember it. We hope to provide you the same clarity today. While investor fears are rampant right now, that does not mean there aren't fantastic opportunities to grow your wealth. But please just keep in mind, you're going to hear from several analysts today with varying outlooks and recommendations. We pride ourselves in having unique and unbiased opinions. That means some of our analysts might be bullish today, while others are bearish. We have never and will never adopt groupthink when it comes to the market. At the end of the day, it's up to you to determine what's best for you and your money. But after this call, I'm confident you'll have the best up-to-date information available to do so. Whatever comes next, we'll be by your side, just like we always have. But please understand that we cannot give personal investment advice. Today's town hall will be moderated by our Director of Research, Matt Wanshank. Our analysts are stationed all around the world, so please be patient if we experience any production issues. As the publisher of Stansbury Research, it's my solemn vow to make sure we're seeing you through troubling times like this. Today is only the beginning of what you can expect from us. Thank you for your time, and we hope you get some clarity from today's event. Matt, you can go ahead and kick things off from Baltimore. Well, thanks, Brett. Uh, it certainly is a, a time for a town hall. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, on Thursday, Vladimir Putin directed his forces, his forces to invade the Ukraine. This is a, a major military action. And of course, uh, situations like these always run the risk of, of expanding and roping in other countries. And, and there's fears that it'll turn into a, a large scale, scale war between Russia and the West. Uh, and we don't know precisely what Putin will want to do next. So with all that at risk, uh, the S&P took a big slide on Thursday morning before climbing back by the end of Friday. Uh, oil prices in the U.S. spiked above $100 a barrel before coming down to around 90 uh, Brent crude in Europe is still above 100 over the month, uh, gold's risen from $1,800 to $1,900 an ounce. Uh, the MSCI index of Russian stocks dropped from $700 to about $450. Uh, and uh, that was all as of Friday's close. Now, as of uh, Monday morning when we're recording this, uh, early indications are that uh, the market is selling off again. Risky assets are, are heading down. Stocks are falling. Uh, if you want to look at what proper positioning can do for investors, uh, four of our five portfolios solutions portfolios are doing better than the S&P 500 for their fiscal year. Only the forever portfolio is lagging right now. Uh, and the defensive portfolio is up 2.1% as of Friday's close. So no one likes to uh, check their account balances and see them falling. And when you mix that with the fear and stress of a situation like this, we just wanted to reach out, uh, talk to our readers, and, and see what we can do to put your mind at ease. We're going to talk uh, mainly about markets and finance and, uh, and investments. Uh, so I'd just like to say up front that the situation in Ukraine is horrific, and I think we all appreciate and understand that. Uh, but the best thing we can do is, is help you protect and grow your wealth. That's our job. So uh, I hope you don't think we're cold or uncaring.
thing for talking about money in a time like this, but but it's what we're here for. Uh, we're going to ask uh, our top analysts to answer the questions that we think uh, you're probably wondering about right now. We're going to talk about some short-term trades, longer-term investments. We're going to talk about where the economy might go from here, and maybe even some uh, uh, bigger picture things about what this may mean to your life. So let me introduce the, the panel we've put together today. Uh, in the studio here, we have Scott Garlis, the editor of the Stansberry Newswire. We have have Greg Diamond, editor of Ten Stock Trader, our technical advisory service, and I, I failed to mention that I'm Matt Weinshank, the director of research. Um, via Zoom, we have uh, Doc Eifrig, editor of Retirement Millionaire, uh, Brett Eversall, the co-editor of True Wealth, Dan Ferris, the editor of Extreme Value and host of Stansberry Investor Hour. Matt McCall, the editor of the McCall Report, uh, Kim Iskian, our international editor at large, and we've also got Bill McGilton, uh, one of our longtime analysts who lives in Ukraine, in Kiev, uh, and I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. Now, we don't have a time limit. Uh, we can just talk through everything, and we've got a great team here, so I may address questions to, to one person or another, but please just uh, jump in at any time and share any thoughts you've had. I think we're just going to talk through this, uh, you know, the way we would talk about it here in the office and, and take our readers along for the ride. So I do want to start with uh, Bill. Bill was in Kiev until a few days ago. We've been getting uh, email updates from him every 12 hours or so uh, as he escaped the country, and I, I think he's made it out now to Bill to Moldova. So, Bill, you're safe. You're out. Are you feeling good? How are you doing? Uh, I'm I'm feeling good. Thanks, Matt. I'm I'm glad. You know, I'm glad I made it. Frankly, I mean, you know, I I did that little video that was on the in the digest. I think on Friday or something. I was actually I was actually talking to Kim on the phone because he he wrote me an email. I gave him a call, and in the time I called him, but we, you know we when it first happened, right? Like on Thursday morning, I was sleeping. I'll just say it like this, and all of a sudden I just heard boom, like and like six six explosions from like they were on the other side of the river. They were far away from me, but I knew like wow, these guys are actually invading because nobody until then, I would say most of, of the city didn't believe it. You know, like we, we were hearing things for like over a year, right? The, the, Rus the Russian equipment was on the borders for, you know, for, for over a year. And we just kept hearing these things. We kept hearing deadlines and stuff. And after a while, everyone just became numb to it. And then we knew it got a little more serious. You know, much more serious after um, Putin declared, uh, you know, Donetsk and Lugansk um, uh, independent republic. So, but we didn't we didn't expect that. And so, you know, after that, it, it was kind of like we knew there was fighting, and and people still were kind of thinking it was just going to stop or something. But, you know, they weren't in the beginning. They weren't really targeting civilians or. Or anything like that it was more about military targets, you know, radars at airports and stuff like that. And then what happened started happening is by I would say that was Thursday morning, and then by from my perspective, by um, I think I was talking to Kim sometime Friday afternoon. I, I kind of lost track of time, but um, then I started seeing guys. I knew that then we started getting reports for. The, the Russian tanks were coming down from the north. They were fighting in Obolon. And the Ukrainian tanks were starting to come up from the south, and they were going to meet in Kiev. And then, you know, it was there were soldiers going in and out of, of, like, I could see them in front of my house. But then, you know, I started, instead of seeing, like, two soldiers here and there, all of a sudden there was, like, 20. Then there was, like, 40, right? And I'm like, uh-oh, something's going on. So I, I, I went downstairs and... I'm like, just saying to these guys, like, hey, what's going on? And they're like, look, like, this is going to be the setup point where, because it was, it was a, it was a landmark. I lived near a landmark. So where we're going to just start staging guys to start coming in. There was all these, you know, you're talking like 14, 16 year old guys coming in. They're giving them a machine gun, right? They're going to fight. I mean, and, you know, you have a bunch of 20 year olds. With machine guns, let's say they're all, they're ready to fight, and so the metro was how the metro they were using the metro to kind of position people, 
around the town where where they had to bring them. And then I realized, because I, I figured, you know, okay, if these guys, if the Russians start hitting something, I could go underground because the metro is super deep. It's, the metro was like, it's the deepest metro in the world, actually. But then I realized, wait a second, they're going to, they're going to be fighting inside the metros <laughs> and and it, it and then they were gonna, they told me too the, the soldiers told me they're going to start setting they closed off the the government district where i live not about 10 minutes from that that's actually where i work out of i have an apartment which is like my office where i work out of and so i'm like i got you know and they're going to they were going to set up sniper spots all all, all throughout the apartments and so at that point, I'm like, man, I got to get out of here because it's like, you know, this is going to this is going to come fast. So I just had no time. I couldn't even I couldn't like my computer with with all my stuff. It was in the other apartment. I couldn't even go back and get it because there's literally no time. There's no there's no taxis working at this point. There's no rental car. There's nothing. So my my wife's brother came. He came, the guys let him through, and we just jumped that with just, this is the same clothes I've been wearing since since Friday, you know, and just got in the car and we, eight of us, you know, in a Volkswagen Golf and started leaving Kiev. And as we were, as we were driving south, you know, all I have is like passports and money, some credit cards and a few, few gold coins. And luckily my, my brother-in-law had, he was smart enough to have three tanks of gas because he couldn't get gas. I mean, and then everything, everything stopped working. And so we headed towards um, Western Ukraine and on the way out, I mean, you know, tanks are co so coming into the city, all is coming in is military vehicles. going out. All there is, is, is civilians. And there, you know, and then there's checkpoints, right? So you got to stop. These guys are like, you know, sandbags, guns. You got to go through that. If they don't like the way you look, the you know, they'll, they'll line you up. And I mean, we, you know, luckily we, when we got to Zhidimir was in the city going out to uh, Western Ukraine, we decided to take the back roads, which were was scary because you had Russian saboteurs who were blowing up bridges. You had Ukrainians blowing up bridges. So the, the Russians couldn't bring in more equipment. And the whole time there's an information war. You don't know what is going on because, you know, the news you're getting uh, can't go by the West. The Western news is more accurate, but the problem is it's like a day late, right? So you, you're kind of got to, the only way you could get good news is kind of like look at the social media from the Ukrainian side and from the Russian side, but both are just giving different information that might not be true because they're trying to sway everything. So no one knows what's going on. So you kind of got to go with your gut instinct on everything. And so we decided to take the back roads in, in Jidimir, which was, you know, slow, bumpy roads, pot potholes. You know, at one point there was a, there was a checkpoint over a small little bridge and there was a van in, in front of us and they, they took these four guys I mean, it, it was cold. It was like, I don't know, it was 20, 30 degrees outside. They had these guys stripped down to their underwear and T-shirts with, with, you know, AK-47 from the back of their head. I thought they were going to kill them, like, right in front of us. I don't know what they did. Uh, I, I guess they were suspected of being saboteurs. I was, like, wondering if these guys are going to come out with a grenade, someone's going to come help them, if something was going to blow up. It was, it was pretty crazy, but it was a good thing we did because they – if we waited in traffic to go over the Jidimir Bridge, it, it would they blew it up like around the same time, you know. So all the civilians on board, you know, got blown up. So, I mean, it's just it, it's you know it, it was really nerve wracking, you know, like you just it, it, it you know, and you can't really and you get to a point where you can't. It's hard to trust someone unless you know them. Like you can't. You had to be careful who you're around. People are you know. They could try to take something or do something. It's it was kind of crazy. So with them, you know, we made we made it um, to the city called Ternopil and to a village outside of that. 
But still, I mean, you know, the, the jets are flying all over the country. And so you hear, you know, constantly the air raid sirens, you know, because they're, they're above, you could, you could hear them. And so you got to pay attention, like, you know, should you go out underground? Should you go somewhere? And, you know, then um, yesterday morning, we decided we, we, we had no driver because, right, there was no taxis. We had to get them all. We had to get out. And so, and you can't trust the taxis anymore, right, because, or any service, because someone will just take you and be like, put a gun to you and like, hey, get out of here. <laughs> you're, and you're just like in the middle of nowhere, right? So, so anyways, I mean, we, we do, um, my uh, sister-in-law's mother knew someone who knew someone who was trustworthy. So he took us to this border and that's, that's where I am now, in Moldova, in Moldova. Bill, I have a question. I have a question for you. Were you, uh, this doc here, were you, um, do you think your ability to get through checkpoints was, do you have an American passport you were showing? Like what, what? Uh... The kids, the kids saved us. The kid, because I had, a, I, my, I have a 10 year old and I have a, a one year old. So, and then my, my brother-in-law, he has a, a one year old as well. And so when they saw the kids, they just, the Ukrainian guys, you know, they looked at us and they just waved us through because they, they're not, they don't have, there's so many people going through. There's, there's, it's so much, they don't have time to like, they don't want to hurt their own people, right? They don't want to hurt, they, what they have to be careful of if there's not someone coming with, with a van or something and it's going to blow up the bridge because in, in Ukraine, they're blowing up all, they're both sides are blowing up strategic bridges. And, and so, and I mean, I'm talking, they're, they've blown up some really big bridges. And it's people are suiciding themselves to blow up the bridges. And it, it, I mean, but the kids calm the guys down. You know, like when we went to this, when we crossed yesterday to the Easter River, the guys told us before we crossed, you know, there was like, I would say 15 on each side. They're like, look, we'll let you across, but just know, I mean, at some, if the bridge gets hit, it can get hit at any time. So you're going to take that risk when you cross. And I mean, there's no other way to do it. You just got to take the risk. You know? What's your sense, Bill, of of your future and, and your family's future? I mean, is the Ukraine going to be a place you you go back to? Uh, you think there's going to be much left for you there? You know, I. You know, it's sad because, like, for me, every time I see you know we watch the videos and I see something blown up, I know I know that place, right? Or. I know I might know someone who lives in the building. I know someone, depending who's hiding somewhere. You know, it's like, you know, it's a place where my kid goes to school, and you know, I work, I work there. I go home. I go to to my office. It's like, it's you know, my life. So it's like these guys are like destroying destroying my life, kind of, you know. But I hope, I hope somehow. I, I don't. I I mean, these guys are really brave. Like. Whatever I lose, I mean, just imagine, like, you got, like, 14, 16-year-old kids. I'm not even playing. Like, most of the guys are probably in their early 20s or 30s. But there's there's guys in their 50s, too. They don't care. It's just, like, they, you can go there. They'll give you a rifle. You'll fight. These guys are fighting, you know, rifles against tank armies and tanks. And, I mean, you know, I heard, and I don't know if this stuff is true because I can't confirm it. Like, you know, the Chechens are coming in in ambulances. So like they're using ambulance services, they're using ambulances and they'll take like six ambulances and then they'll go somewhere and all of a sudden the, the Chechens are these kind of, for people who don't know it, there was this part of Russia that these guys have been fighting, they were fighting against Russia and then kind of Russia conquered it, but now these guys are really hardened. And so when Russia sends them, they're, no, they're also known for their brutality and stuff. So, I mean... And, and at first, it, at first, I would say it was, you know, they were they were just they weren't they weren't trying to hit civilians or anything like that. Really, they weren't. Like if someone like sniped from his window, because there's a bunch of guys who'll just take a gun and snipe from his window. But then someone, then the, the Russian guy will take an RPG and and take out you know the side of a building or something. You know, so 
you know, and there's people actually throwing Molotov cocktails at towards tanks out of their windows. I mean, they they put it they put on our on the website how to make how everyone can make a Molotov cocktail. Um, so, you know, if I am, am I going to be able to go back to that? I mean, it just depends if they're going to be able to make peace soon enough. I, and I don't know if that's the case because, you know, I, I don't see if Russia conquers Ukraine, which unfortunately is the most likely salute is my most likely simply because they have the most, you know, they have so much firepower compared to these, these guys are just fighting with, with their heart, basically, you know. And I just don't see how they're going to control them because they just don't, you know, there's, there's people that, it, it, it's like, look at it like, look at it like this. Even people who are in the eastern part of the country who speak Russian, who are more geared towards Russia than they are towards Ukraine. These guys aren't like, hey, the Russian army's coming here. I'm going to join them, right? They're not joining them. It's like they don't want they want they don't want to be part of Russia. And so these these guys, you know, you know, in Western Ukraine and Kiev, who are fighting. I mean, they're just they're going to fight tooth and nail. And I just don't know what's going to be left when when it's all done. So that's. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like this. I was going to say, it seems, you know, militarily, uh, uh, Putin's been surprised by the, the Ukrainian national identity and, uh, you know, what looks to be a, a long term insurgency uh, rather than a quick roll through right through Kiev like he was expecting. Um, Kim, let me ask you a question. So Kim, uh, Kim is our, our international expert. Um, and even within that, uh, he, he's a, a Russia expert. I think he lived there for nine years, some former USSR countries at other times ran a, a Moscow based hedge fund. Um, so, so Kim, you know, when you, when you look at history, I think you find, uh, most leaders act on, on reasonable, uh, motivations, right? Even uh, there's an occasional madman, but sometimes people do things that, that don't seem to make sense. And that really means you just didn't understand, you know, what their, what their values were and what their goals were. So I think when we look at this invasion, um, at least before it happened, it didn't really seem to make sense. It was going to be a huge economic cost, a huge political cost for Putin. Um, so I didn't think it was going to happen. I thought he was going to bluff up uh, uh, until the end because it's so costly for him. So, I mean, what did I have wrong there, Kim? What is what is Putin looking for and, and why is this the path he's taking? Well, Matt, I think, you know, if we just step back for a moment and and just look at what where Russia stands and, and its its relative economic position, it's the if it were a U.S. state, it would be about as big as Florida. So it would be the fourth biggest U.S. state. And, and Ukraine has about as many people as California. And it would be the 35th largest state. It's about as big as, as Nebraska. And Russia has, over the past six years, it's really become, its economy has been become something of a fortress because of all the sanctions from the 2014 annexation of Crimea, which was kind of a dry run. Not a dry run, but it was a, a preliminary taste of what what this war is becoming. So Russia has enormous foreign reserves. Its debt to GDP ratio is very low. So it's not as reliant on foreign capital inflows as a lot of countries. Um, mm -hmm. Its stock market is, well, as of a few days ago, was just three and a half percent of the MSCI Emerging Markets Index. Uh, but on the other hand, Russia has, uh, it's the world's second biggest oil producer, as we know, the world's biggest gas producer at delivers 41% of Europe's gas. It's also the world's biggest palladium producer, number two in platinum, number four in uranium. And it's a huge nickel producer, gold, silver, a lot of other inputs. And um, just kind of in to indirectly address your question, I think one of the biggest impacts uh, of the war in the US so far will be a, a, a war tax of sorts as prices rise for a lot of these inputs and then that feeds through to the consumer. Um, and also, I, I forgot to mention, Russia and Ukraine together make about a third of the world's wheat and 20% of corn. So we might see bread prices going up. Now, um, in the bigger picture, no one knows Putin's endgame. Probably he doesn't know his endgame. And as, as Bill was saying, the initial idea was probably to take over Ukraine, install a pro-Kremlin, a pro-Russian government so that uh, Ukraine wouldn't join NATO. That would 
that would seal the deal for that at least for a while. And that is looking a whole lot more difficult. So the big challenge for policymakers, for NATO, for uh, the White House in the U.S., is going to be able to, is to, to have some sort of off-ramp for Putin so that he can back out of the corner that he's painted himself into without losing total face domestically as well as internationally. Um, there's always a danger that he doubles down and there's the Baltics, which are part of NATO right there. Poland is right there. Uh, there's always that risk of, of this becoming a much broader war. And of course, we wouldn't even be having this conversation if Russia wasn't a, nu wasn't a nuclear power. There's, all, there's that specter which Putin has very, uh, very intentionally raised. Um, I think kind of two things that we're going to be, uh, that we should really focus on in coming days to see where this goes is the domestic support for Putin. Um, he's been in power for 22 years and there's virtually no opposition because the Russian government, Putin is extremely effective at stamping it out. When you look at photos of protests or videos of protests around Russia, they're pretty small because thousands, whenever that happens, people are just herded up and taken to jail. They're beaten. So there's, uh, Putin has been very effective at keeping the opposition at bay. There's no one kind of waiting in the wings to take over. Um, and at this point, it'll take either massive sanctions that really crush the Russian population and they do rise up, which I find extremely unlikely, or someone from Putin's inner circle standing up and saying, okay, this isn't going to do. I find that unlikely too. Um, it's difficult to see how, how it ends, at least from a Russian perspective, without uh, Putin backing down, which just is anathema to, to everything. Um, the other key issue, which I think we're going to address a little bit later, is China's stance and whether China uh, supports Putin and supports the Russian economy, or if China says, look, this is going too far, you really got to, got to ease down, ease back. Um, so those are the two kind of big issues that, that I think we should be keeping an eye on in coming, uh, coming days. Yeah, and, and what's striking to me about um, these sanctions is this is sort of a new level of financial sanction that we haven't seen before. You know, Putin decided to come back and, and, and say his, you know, uh, essentially declare it an act of war and, and say he's ready for nuclear war because we cut off his central bank's access to the world. So that is something that hasn't happened before. This, I think, is a new type of warfare, you know, uh, that uh, is really going to hamper Russia's ability to fund their war. You know, if they can't access their reserves, they can't sell their oil, they can't do any of these things, their entire war plan could could be out the window. Um, so, but my question, Cam, or for anybody really, what are your worries about how much these these sanctions are going to obliterate Russia's economy? What are they going to do to the U.S.? What are they going to do to Europe? How um, how worried about uh, is anyone about this expanding in an economic sense? You know, uh, this this morning, uh, both Germany and the U.S. said they can still buy oil and gas from Russia. So that concerns me a bit that it's kind of defanging the the sanctions that are taken from from a swift basis. Um, Kim, did you see that the Russian foreign ministry on Friday warned both Finland and Sweden uh, not to think about joining NATO? Because if they do, there will be a similar consequence to what's going on in Ukraine right now. Um, and then supposedly uh, the Russian U-boats off of Sweden have now become very visible, like they're, they're blocking the Balkans. Um, and so I would think that would create concern around Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, which, which are NATO nations, if I believe. But uh, anything were to happen there, that would take this all, all to a new level. You have, Kim, you any, any thoughts on, on that stuff? Yeah, I think the um, the risk is that Putin's if he's backed into a corner, what do you do? You 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 pounce and you and you push harder. And I think that that's the big risk from a, a certainly from a military and security perspective. I think um, Matt, just to, in terms of economically, I think the key risk is that a lot of this will fuel through to higher inflation. And I think one of the reasons that I mean the, the big reason that oil and gas are not part of sanctions is that Europe needs to keep the lights on and the, uh, and the heat on. Um, so that's really to limit the, the impact on your people living in Europe. Uh, but I think that still prices, prices have been rising. And a lot of those commodities, a lot of those inputs, um, 
prices are rising just because Russia is such a big producer of a lot of these commodities. I think that's going to be the biggest sort of war tax on the U.S. and Europe. All right. I want to come back to inflation in a moment, but I want to um, turn to the market reaction for a minute. Um, Scott and Greg, you know, we do have recent examples, you know, not just of, of military actions, but actually invasions that Putin has run before. You know, how does a, a trader or a macro investor think about political turmoil like this in general? And what's, what's your playbook for a situation like this? You go first. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, for me, you know, what happened last week, uh, so we've had two major overhangs in the marketplace. Uh, one is inflation and what the Fed's going to do in terms of rate hikes. Uh, the other is Putin invading Ukraine. Um, so we've seen the market sell off because of the uncertainty there. Uh, but what has happened is as Putin has invaded, you've actually taken, taken one of those uh, market overhangs away. Uh, that's why you saw this cover rally late last week. Uh, you know, the markets are bouncing back this morning. Um, I, I think it's it's sort of the same. And one of the things people have said is the fact that they're still going to be able to sell oil and natural gas through all this. And now I think they're they're realizing after the comments from Germany and the U.S. this morning that even with these tougher sanctions, it's still the case. You know, I was reading overnight uh, some of the biggest Chinese banks are saying they won't do dollar transactions with Russia for commodities, but they'll do it in yuan. So that's really interesting there too, is have Russia and China figured out a way to go around the SWIFT banking system because it's a lot of dollar transactions and, and go in a different currency. Um, so that'll be interesting to watch. Uh, you know, going forward, one of the other things I'm watching, uh, last week there was a trillion dollars worth of puts bought. Um, that was versus $800 billion in March 2020. Uh, we have options expiration at you know the third week of of march so we just saw 2.2 trillion dollars worth of options uh, expire last week you know, what's going to be really interesting is you know when those options unwind and that all has to cover because dealers have to get short other things against that you know are we going to see another rally in terms of volatility I, you know I, I i would be cautious um longer term I think this is going to create a buying opportunity for you, but th there's going to be a lot of noise to wade through over the next 12 months. Yeah, Greg, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with Scott, and there's an old saying in the market, buy on the sound of cannons and sell on the sound of trumpets, which is basically buy when the war starts and then sell when it's over. But, um, you know, to, to Scott's point about the amount of, you know, the, just a no, huge notional amount of puts that we sold, you know, it wasn't, it was something that I was looking at as a buy the rumor, sell the fact type deal, um, you know, as you mentioned, there was a lot of uncertainty and it kind of removed some of that certainty. Now, the issue that I have going forward, or at least what I'm expecting um, or trying to discount or factor into is how the Fed plays into this. Um, we have, you know, they're going to, their meetings up in, in a couple of weeks. Uh, they have two things that they have to tackle. They have to attack at least inflation or asset prices and growth. Which one? They can't leave it alone. If they leave it alone, inflation is just going to go through the roof. It's not like they can say, excuse me, Mr. Economic Cycle, just please stop real quick. We've got to figure out this war situation. That's not how it's going to work. Um, so which one are they going to let, you know, have a little bit more leeway? Is it going to be asset prices? Is it going to be growth? Or are they going to have to attack inflation? They're going to have to attack one of them. So from a you know, short term, yeah, I think that, and I noted this in my um, outlook this morning, you know, it's probably, we'll see a relief rally, we're already seeing it, you know, the escalation um, happened over the weekend, but, you know, stocks aren't down as much as you might have thought. Uh, so to me, that tells me, you know, along with positioning that we'll probably see a rally into after the Fed. But then after that, I think that's where volatility is going to start picking up again. Uh, and, you know, if could you put the um, the first chart up? If you don't mind so this is something that I've been tracking for a while and in terms of you know where we are within the cycle the market cycle and I believe we come to a significant inflection point and just looking at some of these growth stocks and a lot of these stocks I had actually traded uh, on the rally up because growth was rallying the uptrend was there you know and then all of a sudden uh, you know, late last year and early this year, I mean, some of these stocks, advanced micro devices down 39%, Adobe, DocuSign, Meta Platforms down 50, Netflix down 50, NVIDIA down 40%. These aren't, this is, these are growth stocks and they're down by huge double digits. So the way I look at it is this is signaling to me, regardless of what the major indexes are doing, underneath the market, it's not very healthy. 
Um, and so if you go to the next slide, and I'll go through this really quick, um, you know, this is the other uh, sort of roadmap that I've had and the market from uh, this is back in 1998 up to t the 2000 crash. You know, you had long-term capital uh, management crash and then this huge rally. It's the same exact thing that happened with COVID. It's been this two-year rally and a top. So if you just go to the next slide, you can see um, this is another two-year rally and top. And again, the price action is confirming this. We're seeing it on, on the underlying growth stocks that aren't growing anymore. And then you have to factor in, well, what's Putin going to do? I don't know. What's the Fed going to do? That's going to be the next big catalyst for me to say, all right, look, if the market can't rally because, you know, the Fed actually held back, are they pricing in more inflation? Or if they go to inflation, is this going to hamper growth? Then you throw in China and, you know, it becomes, you know, a cocktail of a of, of lot of uncertainty. So, you know, if the market proves me wrong, so be it. I'll, you know, I'll adjust to that. But right now, this is kind of the roadmap that I'm following. So you would say uh, military action generally a short-term buying opportunity, but there's a, a lot more layers going on now that makes it right. harder. I mean, you know, Scott mentioned earlier, what if what if Sweden and Finland all of a sudden, you know, they, they, they start getting bombed or invaded? I mean, that, you know, there's a lot of uncertainties and, you know, I, I'm not a geopolitical expert by any means, but I think you have to start pricing that in because nobody knows what Putin's going to do. And that's, that's why the put buying has gotten so high, just uh, for people at home. The put buying yes. is indicative of institutions looking for protection and, and yep. the way you framed it, they were more scared of this than they were apparently of COVID, at least from a financial perspective. Yeah, yeah, they were they were buying buying downside protection. So, uh, Abby, can you pull up that uh, photo of the the charts on what Greg was talking about with with by the war? Um, so, as you can see from from recent past instances here, uh, the majority of the time that the market tends to rally off of the uh, the sound of cannons, as Greg said, um, but. Yes, what you're talking about is uh, so institutions, instead of unloading stocks, sometimes what they do is they buy downside protection. So they buy puts against their positions. And that way, if the market goes down, the, the gains they're making on that, that put buying is offset by the losses. But that way, their portfolios aren't getting wiped out. Um, the other interesting event we've been seeing uh, last month, we saw this versus October, the amount of retail put buying has actually doubled. Um, so retail is, is either getting very short or they have a lot of downside protection, too. So that needs to unwind at some point. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, rallies are going to be short term in nature right now. Um, but, but again, longer term, you know, if we go back to, say, uh, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland, that that was the beginning of World War II. Uh, I looked out, you know, 12 months later uh, on a total return basis, which is dividends reinvested. You only lost about 1% in the S&P 500. Uh, two years later, you were up about three. Five years later, you were up 100%. Um, now, I, I know, you know, Greg and I were talking about this earlier. That was coming off the heels of the Great Depression. Uh, times are certainly different. Uh, but I, I think with long-term resolve, it, it sort of helps you look through a lot of the noise and, uh, and think about where you want to be. Yeah. Well, I, I do want to go back to that inflation for a minute. I know uh, Doc and Dan, among others, uh, you've been big on inflation for a while now. And I think this really, you know, forget transitory, this is really going to extend the timeline um, for, for rising prices. So uh, do you guys have any updates to your outlook given this, uh, these new inflationary pressures? I don't. Um, I, I, I still say prepare, don't predict. You know, I don't need to use this as a, an excuse to start making predictions that I don't like to make anyway. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're reading extreme value, you're following my advice or listening to the podcast or whatever, it really is. This is just kind of, um, an example of, of what you're preparing for. So I think the portfolio will do well, even if we don't see, um, you know, these huge inflation prints month after month. And I'm curious, you know, the, the, the comparisons get harder like April, May, June into July and stuff. And I'm curious to see how that plays out. I don't need to predict it. Uh, I just need to be prepared for it in a way that doesn't hurt me if we don't continue to see, you know, seven plus percent. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm steady as she goes. Doc, what do you think? We've been, we've been debating whether that 7.5 CPI number was going to be the peak. Uh, and, and the comparisons do make it difficult, but you know this really throws. Uh, this is going to change the whole game. And also, uh, 
there's there's really two types of inflation. There's inflation that shows up in CPI, and then there's kind of what people experience. And uh, it's meant to be similar, but I think especially in times of crisis or rapid change, those things really diverge, and CPI doesn't do such a good job. But um, you know, you've been on inflation for a couple of years, Doc. Now, what do you think um, when you see these energy prices going up even higher? Uh, how long can this uh, last, and how can it really affect people? Yeah, Matt. Thanks. Um, you know what? What strikes me is the there's some components here that are critical to human existence: food, energy, and housing. Sort of the basic fundamentals. And if you look at food, I, I think. Um, Kim brought it up, but um, Ukraine produces um, a good chunk of, I have slightly lower numbers than Kim, but let's say it's 20% of the world's corn and wheat. Um, they, they had record exports last year uh, of corn to China in, in dollar volume. So, um, so, so corn to China is critical and that, that chart has gone up off the charts. China's hurting, their pork prices are down. They've got a movement politically where they you know, tell people what to eat. So they've demanded that pork producing go up. That's a huge problem for them. If you got increased corn, you're supposed to be feeding your population with pork, pork prices down. That hasn't even rolled into because the harvest won't be until this spring for some of the wheat and corn on uh, Ukraine. I just I think that um, if you look at housing, you've already seen um, one of the indicators, just a mortgage rate. If you look at that on a chart, it just spiked up. That makes housing that much more expensive to get into. Um, then you you have what um, what's been pointed out by Greg Diamond there that what happens if you start to see Russia messing around with transportation blow up a ship here and there, just, you know, as Putin's last ditch attempt, now you've got even worse supply problems. Um, and then you've seen it in the high yield bond um, pricing. And that's been kind of that spread has widened out. So it's means these risky assets that before everyone was able to, uh, to finance and refinance and kick the can down the road. So that's going to come to roost. And I, you know, I was thinking over the weekend and talking to some folks about um, sort of the next step or how they cycle. And to me, the world has gotten to this place where um, hard goods, whether you want to call them commodities, but even things like building, you know, you can't find someone that will wield a hammer and fix your front porch for months, nine months, 10 months to, to build a fence, real hard physical things. Yet I can find you know, 10,000 different NFTs to buy, corners of a picture of this and corner of a picture of that. Um, so I, I don't know, I worry that there's a whole cadre of, of young folk who in past times went to war at this moment, you know, where, all right, let's get the military going and let's go help Europe. Um, but they, they can't do anything physically. Like they can't wield a hammer. They can't cook. They can't and won't wait tables, won't work in restaurants, won't wash dishes. I don't know. I hate to be that old guy that says, I remember when people worked hard. Um, but it's a problem when the government says uh, there's a crisis and we'll just pay you. And then we're going to tax the future. That's a problem if you can't get goods and can't get services. So um, and that's real. You know, you know, Bill, Bill McGilton right there said, thank goodness his brother-in-law, I think you said, Bill, had decided to stock up and have three extra cans of gasoline. Otherwise, Bill wouldn't be here with us today. And, you know, that's, I think the, the note you wrote, Bill, too, you left with, you missed the, you buried the lead on this. He left with diapers and yeah. gold and three yeah. cans of gas. And that's kind of basic fundamental things. I don't know. I don't think it'll get that bad in the United States, but I do see this problem um, where goods and services will still increase. So I don't think we've seen the, the high print yet. Yeah, I think everyone knows the, the energy situation with Russia and how much they supply. But, you know, we've seen how 
uh, easy it is to break the supply chain with, you know, one ship getting stuck in the canal, messed everything up. I mean, this is going to be that on uh, at least 10 times that scale. So uh, the supply chain is already uh, a disaster. So this is only going to make it worse. And I think that's going to extend that um, inflationary picture. Um, well, and, and just just interrupt, too, you know, Germany just shut down their last nuclear plant. I mean, that was a that was a way around this and a clean way around it. Um, now the world is starting to think China is putting on, I don't know, online. They've got another 20 nuclear plants coming online soon. So they're going to get themselves out of the being tied to uh, uh, to this energy flow. But we're not. We're still <laughs> we're we're behind the eight ball on that one. So but you did bring up China. And I want to ask uh, uh, Brett Eversall a question. Uh, you, uh, you and Steve sort of have two particular areas of interest here. And the first one, uh, an area that you focus on is China and Asia and investing there. Uh, so, so where does China and the Chinese market stand of all in all of this? You know, China and Russia are, are fairly friendly. Um, and we also know China has been eyeing Taiwan and, and that was seemed like as much of a risk as, uh, as Ukraine for a while. So what do you see coming from China, uh, politically and from a market perspective? Sure. Thanks, Matt. Um, you know, I'm not a, a political expert, so I don't want to spend a lot of time there. One thing I will say is that, you know, what's going on in Russia and the Ukraine is uh, it's, it's not a good situation, and it certainly has some global economic impacts. Um, but I think if China were to kind of make a move on Taiwan, I think that would be a much kind of larger, especially to the West, kind of uh, impact on the global economy. Obviously, Taiwan is a huge for semiconductors globally. Um, so I don't think that China could really use what's happening today kind of as a smokescreen to do something in Taiwan. Um, so I think if that's kind of, if people are thinking that, I, I don't really see that as a, as a possibility. Um, but, you know, talking about markets, you know, Chinese stocks are always riskier. I mean, they are an emerging market. And so they are always riskier and going to be more volatile than uh, the market here in the U.S. And we've seen that play out recently. Um, but I think there's an incredible opportunity setting up in China. And but to be specific there, I think it's setting up. I don't think we're there yet. Um, you know, Chinese large caps are trading pretty much at their March 2020 lows right now. And uh, Chinese technology companies are trading at about seven year lows. So with those prices down so much, you know, valuations are in many cases some of the best on record. Um, so you can look at that one of two ways. You can say, well, are those valuations cheap? But the economics are about to get really bad for those companies. Well, most of those companies operate pretty much wholly inside of China. So I don't think what's happening is really going to have a big impact on kind of on corporate profitability in China. Because of that, I think those valuations kind of are legitimate and are really setting up a, a fantastic buying opportunity in China. But again, the problem here is that, you know, the trend is not in place. You know, I work with Steve and from the get go of uh, starting working with him over a decade ago, it's cheap, hated in an uptrend. That's really what we look for. And that's how you can kind of safely invest in what would otherwise be less safe uh, kind of markets. And China is certainly a market like that. So, you know, the trend's not there. Um, and we would definitely want to wait for that before we put any money to work. And also, if you're going to put money to work in those places, you just got to be disciplined. You know, that means that means waiting for the trend to buy. And that means having and following stop losses uh, on all of those investments. You know, right now in True Wealth, we only have one Chinese recommendation in the portfolio. I looked back and two years ago, we had five recommendations uh, that were based in China. And we've gotten out of those because as you know, that market's fallen, we've hit those stops and been disciplined and sold. Um, so again, if you're going to invest in China, and I think there's a great opportunity setting up, you've got to do it from a disciplined perspective. You know, one thing that's interesting, though, uh, I don't think a lot of people realize this, is that U.S. investors actually have been pouring money into China and are not really doing it in a disciplined way. Um, so that China large cap ETF has seen its shares outstanding double over the last year. Um, and the Chinese tech ETF has seen its shares outstanding go up 4x over the last year. So US investors have been kind of buying that dip. And as it dips lower, buying more and more and more and really pouring money into Chinese stocks um, in a way that really hasn't happened uh, in the last you know seven to eight years, something like that. So really, you know, I think this is a great opportunity setting up. I think the valuations are there, but I'd like to see some of that kind of optimism and interest from U.S. investors burn off a bit. And also, we just got to wait on the uptrend. So great opportunity, but it's just we're not quite there yet. OK. And if we have higher inflation, political turmoil, um, maybe and the Fed raising rates and all these things, that's a challenge uh, to the melt up. What do you where do you guys stand on that now? Is the melt up on? Uh, I, I'm sure our readers would love to hear. Sure. Yeah, of course. Well, you know, I think. 
it's hard right now in 2022, seeing the difficult times we've had in the first two months of the year. Uh, but a little perspective, like last year, the market, the S&P 500 was up, I think, 29 percent. And it was basically a volatility free move. You know, obviously, you look underneath the hood and you see growth stocks getting crushed and things like that. But the S&P's largest drawdown was about 5 percent. People have gotten kind of used to that, but that is not normal. That's not typically how markets work. So I went back and looked. Um, since 1950, there have been 37 corrections, uh, being a 10% or more fall in stocks. So over 72 years, that's about one every two years. Um, what's interesting is that of those 37 corrections, only 11 of them turned into bear markets. That is a 20% fall or more. So what that means is 70% of the time when stocks fall 10%, they don't end up falling 20%. So corrections are very normal. Bear markets are much less likely. Um, what's also interesting is that when you end up in a melt-up type environment, uh, corrections become even more normal. So in 1999, the NASDAQ almost doubled in value. But during that single year, it had five 10% plus corrections all within one 12-month window. So you... I mean, it's just kind of logical when you think about it. You can't have a situation where stocks can kind of soar to unimaginable heights, but not have volatility. You know, that's what happened last year to a certain extent. We had a very strong year with no volatility, but that's not generally how it works out. And I think today's environment is kind of kind of more normal. Um, and what always happens is when that sell-off is happening, everyone starts to notice all of the issues that were kind of already there that everyone ignores when stocks are going up. So right now, I think it's really easy to look around and find potential problems. But a lot of those problems existed three months ago. We're just only thinking about them now because stocks are selling off. So, you know, I think that uh, I think the melt up is still in a good place. And I think what's happening right now is normal. You know, the other big issue that people raise is obviously the Fed and the rate hike cycle that's coming. Um, we've written a lot about this recently, but the stock market actually has a pretty good history of moving higher during Fed rate hike cycles. So we saw that in the last one a few years ago, in 2015, 2016, 2017. Um, it happened in the mid-2000s where the market rallied through the, I think there were 17 rate hikes from 2004 to 2006. And then in the late 90s as well, uh, the market kind of rallied through the rate hike cycle. So what we found in looking at the data is it's not really the rate hikes that are problematic, it's more the plateau in rates. And that makes sense when you think about it as well, because you know the Fed generally is hiking rates to either slow down an overheating economy or tame inflation, once they stop hiking rates, that means they've kind of done their job. They've started to slow down that economy and that's going to then eke into uh, profitability and then that's going to hurt valuations and then you're going to start to get that sell off in stocks. So it's really not the, the rate hiking cycle that's problematic. It's more the plateau in rates. And, you know, we haven't actually gotten that first rate hike yet or that first rate hike yet. And we'll probably be getting rate hikes for the next couple of years once it starts. So I think there's still a lot of time for the market to run higher, uh, kind of in the meantime. And, you know, just one last thing just about the market generally, I think for the last 12 years, you know, buying the dip has been the right move. Um, and that obviously won't always be the case. But I think uh, I think that idea is kind of innocent until proven guilty. And again, when you're 10 percent below highs, it's easy to look around and find the next problem that's going to take the market down another 5 percent. And the problem after that, that's going to take it down 5 percent farther. Uh, but again, only 30% of corrections turn into bear markets. So most of the time that doesn't actually play out. And I think again, like, you know, buying the dip is kind of innocent until proven guilty. Um, so I think there's still opportunity ahead. And uh, sort of in that vein, I want to ask you, Matt, Matt McCall, you're sort of our uh, eternal optimist. Uh, you, you can always see a bright future ahead and, and uh, you, you always have good reason for it. But, you know, 2022, the, the hits keep coming. How, how, do you, um, how do you maintain that view? And what do you think is going to happen here. Again, I, I'm going to guess you're going to say buying opportunity, but I want to hear why you say that because uh, because you always have a good good logic. Yeah, I've been biting my tongue for like an hour now. Just, <laughs> like all the, just, just want to jump in, but I was waiting my turn. Um, you know, in in times like this, there's irrational thinking and suddenly rational, you know, irrational things, they sound rational. I mean, nothing against anybody, but like, we start talking about things that the odds of them happening are so low. I'm a numbers guy. What are the odds of Russia going after Sweden or Finland? 0.0001%. I mean, the odds of something like that, we can't live life like that. And you can't invest like that because you're never going to buy something. I remember 20 some years ago, my first time Wall Street, this old timer came up to me and I said something, why are we buying now these four different reasons? He's like, Matt, I've been doing this for 50 years. I give you 30 reasons every day. Why not to buy stocks? But you look at a 30 year chart in the S&P 500, 
There's no better place in this country that anybody, the average American, can make money. It's, so you have to invest long term. You need to invest in strong companies. I mean, yeah, what's going on in Ukraine sucks. My grandfather's from there. It's, it's horrific. And I'm not pushing that aside. But let's look at what's really going on. Corporate profits are going to be at the highest level ever this year. What are stock prices based on over the long term? Making money. If it's at the best level ever, why, why are we arguing that stocks overvalued or, you know, I, you know interest rates, you know, they're going to go up? Historically, interest rates are still so, so low. Borrowing costs are still low. It's, we're not looking at a situation like 08, 09, where companies are extremely leveraged. We, we don't have that. It's the exact opposite right now, sitting on tons of cash. So in, we have to sometimes take the view of the company we're buying and what that company is going to be doing in 5 to 10 to 15 years from now. In the short term, we're going to have different types of wars. We're going to have the pandemic. I mean, let's go back just two years ago when a pandemic was hitting all the irrational thinking that was going on. Yeah, a lot of it was, was propaganda by the government, but all that BS that was being thrown around and people thought that was going to be the end of the world, basically. You know, we're never going to be able to go outside again. And look how irrational that was. And look how much of a great buying opportunity it was. The market was up over 100 percent in less than two years. I mean, you go back to Kuwait in 1990. The market was down almost 19 percent or so. Again, the irrational thinking that was going on then, that was our troops going into the Middle East and that being a great buying opportunity. By February of the next year, we were back at a new high. So I, I think what we have to do is, is, is look at this crisis as an opportunity, not as, as much as, you know, we, we could sit here and, and say worst case scenarios over and over. And, and I get it. There's a, there, there is a slim possibility of some of this stuff happening. But at the same time, let's look at the optimistic view that this is completely backfired on Putin. This is completely, he was trying to tear apart NATO, tear apart the West. If anything, we've come together. This is going to be great. And look at, look at, you look at a pandemic that accelerated so many of the themes I invest in, whether it be telehealth, whether it be AI. Um, you look at this now. This is such a great opportunity for beating down uh, solar stocks, wind stocks, nukes. I mean, nuclear energy, there's no way we, could, we can meet any of this net carbon zero, all this, whatever they have, how they want to achieve without nuclear power. It's impossible. I mean, there's such opportunities. I mean, we just put a uranium stock out last week. I'm looking at it, it's up 8% today. I'm looking at my watch list, which has been beaten down. Don't get me wrong. But the watch list, my top, all green except for one. On a day where the market, you know, NASDAQ turned green, but the market itself is down and all this terrible stuff we just talked about. There is such great opportunity. Over nearly half of all NASDAQ stocks are down over 50%. So you can look at it one way and say, well, you know, that tells us things aren't good under the hood. You could also get another way it, it, that this has been priced into these stocks. We've priced in the worst case scenario, in my opinion. So to me, there's great opportunity. And the last thing I'll say, Matt, is you look at innovation. I don't care if there's a war in Iraq. I don't care who the president is. I don't care if Putin dies tomorrow or whatever the hell happens. You're going to tell me there's, gonna be, there's not going to be a million more or, or, or percentage more of EVs on the road in 10 years from now. Invest in that. Nothing's going to slow that down. You're not going to slow down artificial intelligence and machine learning. You're not going to slow down uh, clean energy expanding. So invest in those companies. And there will be a lot of ups and downs. And these downs are when you buy into solid companies. And I, again, you know, maybe I'm a cockeyed optimist, but I truly look at this right now as a great buying opportunity. I don't know if this is the bottom. I have no idea. I'm not having pretend. I don't have a crystal ball. But I know that there's a lot of companies on sale right now. Uh, I have no exposure to Facebook, Meta, whatever they're called now. But that company is one of the lead. They're not going to stop bringing in advertising. I mean, it's 50 percent down. I mean, my God, what a great buying opportunity for a large company. So, yes, Matt, you are right. I think it's a great opportunity. Yeah, I, that brings me. I want to talk about some specific investments and see see what you guys think, where where to make some moves here. Um, you know, uh, as Matt mentioned, you know, uh, military actions, wars tend to actually be good buying opportunities. You know, the Cold War sent defense stocks up for uh, a couple decades. Um, Doc, in, back in 2017, you uh, predicted rising conflicts between the U.S. and China, uh, other big players, sort of large-scale war, and suggested people buy defense stocks. And, and you know, hearing it now, that sounds obvious, but at the time, it was actually a pretty uh, uh, non-consensus view. Um, so defense stocks now, Doc, uh, can we be buying them? Or have they made their run? Do you want to uh, still look at those over the long term? What do you think? Yeah, sure. I mean, as long as China, Russia, the United States are doing the, this dance and, uh, and Russia, well, yes, as long as they're doing this dance, yes to defense stocks. Yes, yes, yes. Um, 
I may be taking you off whatever script we have. I want to go back. Um, I want to be that old guy, the old, old guy who came out of his cave for today to talk. And I want to say I'm nervous, right? I'm, and I appreciate Matt McCall. I love your enthusiasm. And this makes this next few years a stock picker's environment. That's what we do. So I'm excited. Fred Eversole, in all due respect, you know, looking back at Fed rate hikes and stock market, I was young enough, I was a teenager, when I look back to 1972, and if we could throw that chart up here, um, what people will see is that when the Fed started raising the discount rate then, and it took a couple of years, right, from the peak in 72 to 1974, the market was down 50%. CPI kept going up, 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 up. And so I, you know, I got, I got, I'll go back 40 years, but you know, yes, the data from 1990 says, hey, Fed rate hikes are good for stocks, except when I look back a little further in my history, in my, in my brain and my body, I just, I, I'm nervous and shaking right now about overall markets and what could happen with both CPI and rate hikes. And I don't believe in the power of the Fed. I think there are other factors and things in play that we have to pay attention to, but I just want to caution people for that time. And that was a weird time. And I, I can remember parents, you know, of, of my friends just all being depressed because of all the things they'd invested in the nifty 50, the Coca-Colas, the Cloroxes, and those were just a grinding down, down, down. So I, I don't want to be, I don't want to throw a, you know, cold water and ice water on the party, but I want to caution, um, because I feel like we might be closer to that time than not. But I, I don't know. I, I, like I said, I, I like this idea that Putin has made a mistake. Maybe the world comes together. The fact this is the first time that you know we've got a war live. You can see it on TikTok. You can see it on your cameras from all over the place. Maybe this is the time the world gets more peaceful because we back down Putin and say, you know, no, no, no. And then there aren't ships that are attacked or you know, stuff that's these wild low probability thing. So anyway, I, I want to add a little pessimism, but um, yes to defense stocks, Matt, to get you back on track. So <laughs> well, I'm going to stay, about- stay off track. I want to stay on your track now for a moment, Doc. And I want to ask Dan, because this is something I struggle with. Dan, I, I kind of consider you a philosopher of, of big risks and, and thinking about things that can go wrong, because sometimes they do. I, I personally am much more aligned with Matt. I, I'm optimistic. I say, look, you know, no, we're not going to have a, a nuclear war, whatever it may be, whatever people are scared of. But those things do happen, right? They, any one th- bad thing is a low chance, but they do happen and they surprise you when they do. And I think, you know, you could look at Bill's experience the last few days and that's exactly what he's lived through. So, Dan, I don't know if you have an interesting thought on this or, or something to say, but I feel like um, uh, what do you – how do you put those big risks into your head and, and what do you think about – um, this thought that uh, t- bad things tend to not happen, um, and we can we can try and dance around them. What do you think? Right, I think it was uh, was it Dimson, one of those three who wrote that book, Triumph of the Optimist, who said, you know, risk means more things can happen than will happen. And what you know, my thinking on those risks you're talking about is just the nature of risk itself is um, it, risk is, is a width of the probability of outcomes. If you think um, in terms of like, what's the, what, what is probably going to happen when you buy treasury bills? Well, you're going to make a little bit of money and, and that's about it. You're going to get your principal back. What, what is the probability of the outcome any given year when you buy, you know, the S and P 500? Well, you know, as as Brett and a few other folks on this will tell you, most of the time it's going to go up and you're going to make money, but sometimes it's going to go down. Sometimes it's going to go down a lot. And and what is the width of outcomes if you buy, you know, biotech speculations and exploration mining stocks? Well, you know, 10x to zero. Okay, so so that's how I see risk. And I just think there are times you know, for the last year or more, however long it's been now, I just was driven by valuations and speculative fervor, you know? 
And I thought, well, this is one of those times when I think the range of outcomes is a lot wider than a lot of folks. A lot of folks think that, you know, we're going to the moon with all these, you know, highly speculative kind of plays and, and even, you know, still COVID plays and various things that looked a little crazy. And Doc mentioned NFTs, you know, really crazy. Um, and I thought to myself, well, we seem to have forgotten that these kind of episodes, they don't end well. Um, and, you know, it, to, to a large extent, you heard, you know, Matt talking about stocks like, you know, Netflix and Meta or Facebook or whatever you want to call it, down 50%. Well, that was another thing that I was talking about. You know, I admit I've been talking about this stuff forever. Not a perma bull, or I'm sorry, I'm not a perma bear, but, you know, as a value guy, you're always early with everything, right? Whether you're bearish or bullish. So, you know, I warned, you know, I said, look, you, you can lose half your money on a stock like Facebook. And I picked on that one specifically. And NVIDIA, I think I picked one too. This can happen. And people just forgot about that for a while, but they're remembering it now, aren't they? So, you know, my sense is, yeah, you don't want to own the speculative garbage right now. You want to be really careful about that, but uh, you should still be buying great businesses that you find that you think are priced for a really good return. Uh, I don't think, you know, like I said before, I'm not doing anything any different. You buy great businesses priced for a good return and continue to hold plenty of cash, hold gold and silver, right? All the uh, all four parts of this have worked out for, you know, extreme value readers and other people who have listened to it. So, so, you know, I think about, I, you're right. I do try to philosophize a bit about those risks, but as I've gotten older, I've tended to say, you know, I'm not, I'm not predicting anything anymore. I just want to be prepared for whatever happens but I still want to get a good return. So I balance those two things and, and I wind up with the basic portfolio that I just described. That's where I am. So if I could try to marry those two views, I, I think the important thing here is, uh, you know, if you're optimistic and you're using this as a buying opportunity, there's a good chance that's going to work out. But I think you want to realize what your outcomes can be. And if you can handle a 50% drawdown, if you know that these things may not be you, you're not going to time it exactly right, which Matt, Matt obviously admits you could be okay. I think, um, you know, individual investors like our readers have an advantage. Ideally, they're not margined, right? They don't have to get these things right month by month or quarter by quarter. They, they can handle things. Uh, they can wait them out if it takes a longer time to play out. Um, so I think we're probably closer to the same page maybe than it, than it sounds like. Um, and I think that individuals who um, are prepared to ride those growth stocks can still do well if they do it at the right time. But you have to know what you're getting into. Yeah, Matt, I think you, you, you hit on two really important subjects that everybody sort of is, is diversification and time horizon. And yeah, but yet you can be in a very speculative place. Just make sure that all your eggs aren't in that basket. Yeah, And exactly. just and think about, you know, do I want, am I investing for tomorrow? That yeah. might be a problem. Um, well, my next question was going to be, Dan, do you, do you think it's too late for gold and silver here? You think they're, they're serving, they've served their function. Um, but uh, is there any more upside? But I feel like you, you uh, said you were not going to give a prediction on that was your last thought. Well, I wouldn't sell them. You know, if you, uh, I, for me, physical gold and silver are just kind of permanent holdings. You know, you, you never don't own them. So I think you can always buy those. I mean, no matter what the CPI prints, how that develops over the next several months here, like I don't, I don't want to be caught without those things. So, but if you if you then ask, well, what about the upside in you know the equities, you know gold and silver equities, wouldn't sell those either here. I think we're looking at a, a, a longer. I think we're near a, a bigger inflection point in commodities versus stocks. U.S. versus ex-U.S. equities, um, and you know the value growth. So, and I think all those come together. You know, there's you're never just buying one of those. Yeah. I don't think. And just to clarify, so. you you think um, non-U.S. is going to outperform U.S. on that uh, dichotomy there that you just mentioned? You yeah, like foreign... outperform or not? Yeah, outperform or not overall. I think you know you can look at you can look at places outside the U.S. now and expect uh, a better performance. Now, you might not want to go as far as Rob Arnett for Research Affiliates, who I just interviewed. And I don't think we've even aired the interview yet, but 
he says 50% of his liquid net worth is in emerging markets value. <laughs> That's pretty aggressive. <laughs> I wouldn't say to do that, but I think you should have some emerging markets value. And I think you should, you know, maybe even have some Japan and um, another guy, Marco Papachoy interviewed says he likes uh, Chile and Brazil right now. So, so yeah, look outside the U S it's a good time to do that. From a technical or a, a trading perspective, anyone have a, a an outlook on gold here? You think it's run, it's done its duty, or you think there's still more room to go? Well, I'll I'll jump in there, and it's been a little surprising because inflation has been at 40-year highs, and then you have this political term, geopolitical turmoil, and it's it's rallied, but it hasn't really taken off like one would expect. I'll also note that you know Bitcoin and Ethereum haven't been either an inflation hedge or a safe haven um, play. So, you know, those two things are, are, are kind of where, uh, you know, I stand with that technically, you know, I'm like, I think like Dan said, I'm never gonna, I'm not gonna sell them. Um, you know, two big stocks to look at with in terms of gold and silver stocks or ro- the royalty stocks, Franco Nevada for one, Royal Gold uh, two. But I also kind of want to go back to what Doc pointed out about in the 1970s. And this is something that I explained in the, um, at our conference last year in Las Vegas. And that was we reached an inflection point where inflation uh, is either going to take off and stocks drop, like Doc said, 50 percent, or you have kind of have this 2011 scenario, you know, coming out of the Great Recession. You know, everybody was worried about inflation and gold and silver rallied, you know, stocks kind of chopped around and then, you know, everything was fine. Gold and silver went down and then, you know, stocks continued to move higher. That's why I think this next coming Federal Reserve meeting is so important. Because it goes back to what I just talked about earlier. What is the Fed going to attack? Is it going to be inflation or are they going to allow it to, you know, kind of do its own thing because they're worried about what's happening in Russia, Ukraine? They back off. I think to me that is going to be a huge signal. And we'll find out whether we are in a 1970s scenario or whether we get that 2011 scenario, you know, and, and, and stocks kind of take off again. Yeah. Um, Matt McCall, you you know we paint you as a growth guy, but you've got a, a handful of value plays in there when they when they support your innovation theses. You feel like you want to get more on the value side here, or you think you want to be buying the the growth? Uh, I'm looking at the growth. Sorry, I was just looking up a chart while you were talking. So I was just <laughs> looking at that. You know, the CPI. I, I was trying to find it. I did it the other day, but the CPI was down at like 0.2 or something a few years ago. And in that time frame, obviously it goes up to seven and a half, and gold was up minimally in that time frame. Meanwhile, the S&P doubles. So just to show you, I mean, I think gold's a, a terrible investment person. I think it's just absolutely dead money. Uh, but I'm not telling people to sell because I mean, everybody else here really disagrees with me, but I just I just don't see see it. I mean, yeah, I, I have gold that my grandpa gave me. What am I gonna do with gold coin if the world's ending? What am I gonna take it from? I mean, you need guns and ammo and fuel and food and water. I mean, come on. No, no offense, Bill. I know you were two gold coins with you, but I won't tell anybody where you are with those gold coins. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I still look at growth, Matt. I mean, but the thing is, some of these growth stocks that, that, that are in here that, that are projected to grow 30, 40 percent next couple of years annually on top and bottom line, they still may, in my opinion, be value plays. Maybe not along the lines that Dan looks at it, but they're value based on historically where they've traded uh, versus themselves, whether it's based on price of sales, price of book, et cetera. Um, so they have become values like Facebook, again, just, just using an example as a big name or meta, the fact that it's, tr- it's trading now, it's actually a value play based on its historical numbers. So yeah, I want to, I mean, ideally in this situation, I would love to find stocks that meet my innovation, meet growth and at the same time are a good value based on where they've traded in the past and where I think they will be, uh, in the future. And one thing I forgot to say real quick and it's off topic, but you know, we talk about the innovation going forward. You know, just think about Elon Musk, what has happened. You know, he came in, took the Starlink, moved it over to Ukraine, and now, you know, offering uh, internet service. That just shows when we have crises, what the opportunities are and then how people step up and how entrepreneurs step up in situations like this. So, again, that is why I'm so optimistic and, and bullish on the innovation stocks. And, again, th- I think Dan said this. You, I want to invest in solid companies here. I'm not just throwing darts at some speculative company because it's down 80%. That, that, not at all. We're looking at companies that – I, I, it's very simple. I always tell people on a podcast, if, if you look at a company and you say, I think it's going to be much bigger in five to 10 years from now, it's probably a good investment. You're not always going to be right, but it's a very simple way to look at it. If the company grows, the stock price will go up with it. Kim, how about you? Um, international perspective, U.S., non-U.S., what do you think is the, the place to be as this plays out? You know, uh, it's U.S. stocks have 
been on a massive outperformance run over the past 13 years uh, with just March 2020 being the blip. And it's just historically unprecedented. I've been thinking for a while that it's time for that equation to flip and for U.S. stocks to underperform. And, it, you know, we don't have to look back too, too far where we see a, an extended period of the S&P 500 not doing much for years. I think that there are a lot of arguments to be made for international stocks. I know that's a very broad basket, but everything from Europe to Japan to emerging markets to really outperform. Uh, however, I think there are a lot of, it, it's difficult to put such a broad blanket over all international, or, I mean, ex-US stocks, because for example, within emerging markets, you have commodity producers and you have commodity consumers. And that's a huge distinction. You want to be Brazil. You don't want to be um, Sri Lanka. You don't want to be Indonesia that imports. Um, Indonesia is a bad example, but a lot of a lot of emerging markets import a huge portion of their oil. They're crushed, whereas the Brazils and in other circumstances, Russia uh, are are dancing to the to the bank. Um, I think you know just to go back to what Brett was talking about, saying about Japan. I'm sorry, China. I think that what's happening in Russia kind of highlights some of the reasons that emerging markets are historically, they trade at lower valuations than developed markets, so lower PEs. Um, and a lot of investors tend to say, well, I don't really know what goes on there. I'm not sure about the politics. I'm not sure if corporate management is going to rip me off. When you look at uh, the Russian stock market over the past 20 years, it's traded at uh, a huge discount. It's been one of the cheapest markets in the world for a long time. And guess what? Now we know why. Now we see what was really being discounted into all of that. And I think that one of the risks of um, the Chinese market is that valuations just are structurally lower. And then investors say, wait a second, look what Russia did. Now, obviously, Russia and China are completely different animals. But when we looked at, when we consider an authoritarian regime where the government has a great deal of leeway to do whatever the hell it wants. Um, I think there are some similarities. And I think there might be some concern that, and people say, well, yeah, Chinese equities are trading at, at long-term lows, but should they be trading anywhere higher given all the regulatory risk and arguably the elevated, um, the elevated political risk. And also China is a net commodities importer for a lot of um, commodities. So there will be, macro pressure if, uh, if commodity prices stay high. Uh, Dan, I think you had a thought. Uh, you know, we're still trying to figure out if Bitcoin is a risk asset or a defensive asset here, right? The story is kind of defensive asset, but it seems to behave like a risk asset. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah. So we, we talked with Mike McGlone from, uh, from Bloomberg on the podcast, and he insisted that 2022 is going to be the year when um, Bitcoin is no longer this sort of risk on speculative thing and it turns into a real you know risk off uh, asset like gold has been recently <laughs> um, and and for the last 5,000 years um, and so far that hasn't happened right if we, if like I, I watched this because I, I don't have any prediction about when that's going to happen I expect it to happen if things work out you know over the long term. But um, I watched this, you know, as soon as as soon as the invasion of of Ukraine hit the headlines and hit the markets, I was like, well, OK, stocks are down two or three percent and Bitcoin is down seven or eight or nine or whatever it was like right away. Uh, well, it hasn't happened yet. It's still just a speculative long, a risk on speculative asset. And I've even been watching just looking at my phone as we've been talking and and basically a couple of the big indexes went from red to green and Bitcoin went right along with it. So, uh, you know, I think it will be some kind of a store of value um, over time, but time ain't here yet, man. It's, it's still just a long, it's, a, it's like a speculative tech long. Yeah. Um, I okay. jump in real quick, Matt, just yes. on Bitcoin, I have to jump in real quick just because I'm take the opposite side. Um, I, I think it's going to be there sooner rather than later. It will be a store of value, and it comes down to simply supply and demand. There's only ever going to be 21 million mined. There's over 19 million mined already. There's speculation four to five million of those are already lost forever. 
So it is a mm -hmm. simple supply and demand because supply coming online is very little right now. Uh, demand is increasing at a higher rate. So over time, that simple economics, you know, supply and demand tells you prices will go up. Um, I, I think there's a large part of, of the crypto market that will not be around in a few years, just like marijuana stocks years ago, whatever any tr you know, trend was happening years ago. But I, I do believe Bitcoin will be around and it will be a true store of value. And um, Grayscale does a great paper on, on, on taking gold versus Bitcoin and you take any really situation and Bitcoin has a bit of a slight advantage, if not equal with, with gold. And especially the fact that nobody really my age or younger even knows what gold is or never buy gold, they're going to buy Bitcoin for a store value. So as the old folks start dying sure. off, it's going into gold or going into Bitcoin, sorry. Well, maybe one, day, maybe one day we'll have a little debate about this, but <laughs> gold's a 50 bagger since, it, since 1971. Um, oh, that was know, a, it's, a it's been around for 5,000 years. <laughs> yeah, nothing special about it. The, the, <laughs> the currency went this way, gold went that way, and and it's you know made a new it's high in the last 20 years. recently. Um, it's actually done really well. It's outperformed the S and P 500 this century, hasn't it? So, you know, it, it's it's actually done great. It's done exactly what we thought it would do. So you think it could go from 1900 value, to 3,000? I mean, you think that's a possibility well, well, at any time in a near of course it is. next century? Of course it is. Of course it is. And I also think you, not you or me or anyone on this call knows really what Bitcoin is or what it's going to do. It's not even 20 years old yet. It's not even 15 years old yet. But it's worth owning because, you know, of its characteristics. But, to, but, but it is untried. As a store of value, it is completely untried and unknown. Gold, on the other hand, is not untried or unknown. And it's done really well over the long term. And you know, Lindy, Lindy effect is is you know another five thousand years. We'll still be we'll well, still I'm be five thousand forty six. So I'll see how it's doing. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna go back to Bill, and then we're gonna check uh, check in just see if anyone has a last thing to add. Um, Bill, most of our readers are are in the U.S. and we're fortunate to live in a in a place that's stable and safe. And I think you were you were pretty comfortable in Ukraine, and and you didn't expect this really to happen. Um, so, do you just want to share anything with our readers? How does it feel when when real trouble comes to your door? And is there anything people should be ready for, or should be thinking about uh, to keep themselves safe? Yeah. Um, look, I mean, you know, the U.S. obviously is probably the most stable country in the world with, with Britain or probably France or something like that, I guess. But, you know, Ukraine and the former Soviet countries, for the most part, were pretty, pretty stable, too. I mean, yeah, they have events and stuff. And it's like in American history has events. But people are, are you know, very stable. Um, I think this event, unless it gets stopped soon, is going to turn into something far bigger than what we think because there's 15 active nuclear reactor plants in Ukraine, okay? And what Kim was saying earlier about giving Putin an off-ramp, that's the whole key because, you know, I've been studying, you know, I'm looking at their side, the Russian side of, of what their point of view was because even... I don't agree with it, but you got to, you know, I'm a lawyer by background and I always look at the other side, what the other side is saying. And for them, this is not just about Ukraine. It's about security guarantees, meaning they don't want buildups on their border, right? So I, you know, I think these guys are going to, will push it to a place that we're not even prepared for yet. I mean... This is this this is not ending here. Even if they they unless they make some kind of deal, which you me more than, as much as anybody hopes happens. I mean, but I just think this this has the potential for to, to turn into something that most people don't even realize. The, from their perspective, they're cornered, right? And that's that's even though. For us, we don't see it that way. They're, they have a, uh, 
you know, a different look at the world like they, they own, like they own Ukraine, right? Obviously, Ukrainians don't want to be owned by them, but that's their view. And I just don't know how far they're going to go. And, and you know, because they're getting, you know, they're getting dirtier over there. They're, I'm hearing they're targeting civi civilian places now just to show force to say, look, this is we're going to take it. So I don't think unless this somehow by a miracle could they could work something out. I, this can get really, really bad, unfortunately, I think. Well, Bill, please uh, stay safe over there. I don't know if you're going to get further away or, or what your plan is, but please take care of yourself and your family. Um, and uh, does anyone, before we sign off, does anyone have a, a closing thought, something they felt our readers needed to hear or anything to add? Doc, I see your hand. Yeah, so I just, I'm reminded when I listened to Dan and, and Matt McCall, um, and then earlier it came into my mind as well. I just want to express this one thought about investing in anything, and it has to do with liquidity. And there's obviously a scale of things that are liquid, like my my farm in Northern California where I grow grapes is very illiquid. And then on, on the other extreme are super fast option markets that can be created out of thin air instantly. Um, price, people invest in things and make a mistake a lot, I think, believing price is a continuous curve. And uh, I just wanna remind folks that it's not. This, this stuff can make discrete jumps and moves. And uh, just to be aware of that, when you think about price, if this is a time to buy or this is a time to sell. Um, and I don't know why I wanna share that other than I wanna share it with our subscribers. And I want people to think about that because I think it's missed, you know, whether Bitcoin stores value, it clearly is making these large discrete moves still, gold much less so. And it may be a difference between that it might be supply, it might be volume. Anyway, I, I, I just wanted to share that. This is kind of one of those things where um, I wanted to express that, so. Yeah, Matt, I, ju I just, it's funny he says that. I just wrote a digest about that. In fact, the title of it was called, you know, something like, I think we called it Prices Leap, They Don't Just Glide. Mm. And, it, and that's exactly, and liquidity that Doc just mentioned, you know, it comes and goes, it's not static. Um, so, yeah, I, I I agree. I think Doc's message there is timely. I just I'm just gonna piggyback. I wasn't gonna say anything, but those are great points both both years made. And same thing I always tell people. You know, look at if you had a value of your home like the stock market and went up and down. Imagine people that would be selling their home when it when it went down to move to another neighborhood. I mean, it'd be crazy. So sometimes you have to just don't look at it, look away, and know you're investing for the long term. All right. Well, uh, everybody rest assured, you know, we'll be keeping you informed on how this all plays out in markets through the Stansberry Digest and our various publications. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to survive and thrive during upheaval. upheaval. So a, a short-term trader may make one decision, a long-term investor another. Um, but we always uh, provide the relevant information to you and explain our investment thesis uh, and strategy so you can understand how it all works together. You can expect to hear more from each of our panelists, the rest of our analysts in the coming weeks again through the digest through our publications we'll be covering all this for you so thanks to our team uh, that was here for all your insight and thank you at home for watching <laughs>